Welcome. Thank you. Thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, I have to say, Dominic, future gov, it sounds a little Orwellian to me. Good. Your, your that's good. that's, that's right? the is intention. That, is that what you said out there? Yeah. So, Mayor, we have the, the real digerati here. I got it. Uh, let me start with Mayor Bowser, who's been in uh, office for a very fast 10 months. Yes. And when we're talking today about the digital city, digital leadership, the kind of interfaces, what do you, what do you have on your dashboard? And, and if you don't have a dashboard yet, what do you want these folks to put on the dashboard? Well, mayors always want to be able to go out into any community and talk to residents about what matters to them. Um, so I look uh, daily at what, what our public safety numbers are, how we're serving our residents who, who need human services, especially our homeless residents. Uh, and then I'm looking at basic things like if we're picking up the trash and if people are coming to work. Uh, Is there so, data on that? On absolutely. The, yeah. And so we want to be able to, and we are testing iterations now and 10 months in office about how I can look at something quickly, whether it's a graph or a table, um, and be able to tell that story to residents. Now, Hillary, you are inside the U.S. federal government. You're sort of, a, you know, a, a pocket of, of digital excellence in a, in a very clunky government, <laughs> uh, in, in my, my perspective anyway. So tell us, you know, from your federal perspective, what, what, what is your purview and as you look out there, and, and is there any relevance in what you do to the cities and, and mayors from your experiences? Sure, I, <clears throat> ATNF is, <clears throat> excuse me, ATNF is a, essentially a client services team inside the General Services Administration. So we work uh, with agencies who come to us with ideas, with problems to solve, um, and we help them either get on the path toward building something, you know, building those dashboards, putting data services online, or helping them figure out how to buy it. You know, we, we do a lot of consulting about making smart choices for procurement. Um, and, you know, we work with, We've, we've worked with probably 20 or 25 different teams and different agencies throughout the federal government uh, in our last 18 months of existence. And, you know, the landscape is really about, for me, it's about changing the nature of what they expect out of, a, out of a digital service engagement. You know, we are definitely trying to make products better. We're trying to make transactions better. But uh, for us, it's really kind of that it's threading the needle about changing expectations for uh, how services can get delivered by a team in a fast, agile, user-centered way, you know, focusing always on the people who are going to be using it. And uh, so what we really hope is that, that those sort of themes, the way we work, gets adopted more than really the, the things that we build. I mean, we, of course, we want adoption on the things that we build, but it's, it's, for us, it's, it's a lot about the way that we work. But you are a government employee. I am. And, and you work for a place called 18F. It's something yes. in, in, in the general service. What does 18F stand for? Uh, it's actually our little homage to 30 Rock. Uh, so the General Services Administration headquarters building is at 18th and F I see. in D.C. So you're, you're sending a signal that we're cool. <laughs> we're cool, we're different. We are yeah. cool. Well, well like, at, you know, hopefully, hopefully maybe not we're cool, but definitely different, absolutely. So what, what advice do you have for the mayor from your own experiences of trying to transform the way government works and government thinks about digital issues? The mayor's come in in, you know, 10 months and is and is still whipping the city into shape. So what advice do you have for her? Before I was a federal employee, I worked with a company that does a lot of work with state and local governments, primarily states, but then we would work with local governments as well. And um, one of the things I was always amazed by was the uh, sort of quote unquote trickle down effect that we saw from the federal government. And so anything that we can do to lead and again to change expectations and to put a new way forward is absolutely trickling down to states and cities. Um, and we, we've seen that, uh, hopefully we're seeing that from work that we do in, in, in conjunction with the U.S. Digital Service, but we're also seeing it a little bit from the bottom up from organizations like Code for America. And I think I would encourage the mayor and, and the mayors in, right. in attendance to really be paying attention to that entire landscape to see what you can, you know, steal and borrow, mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of services, but again, in, 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 in those, uh, the processes and the practices almost as much. Right, and Stephen, we are, we are modeling those types of practices already. I think we saw the federal government early on say that we need a chief innovation officer. And so cities all across our nation are having people not just focused on computers and lines of where things run, but how you're innovating mm. uh, across the space. Uh, we've seen 
seen in the federal government, and 18F is a wonderful example how you get great technologists who can drill down quickly and almost like SWAT teams uh, on problems. And so that's what um, our chief performance officer will focus on. Mm. Um, and then we saw that people, if you open up the data uh, and ask them to help us solve, uh, solve the problems with solutions from the private sector, it works. And uh, we recruited uh, our code for DC person uh, to come into the government and help us do those things too. So building the team um, is, is part of what we've been doing for the last uh, 10 months and raising the expectations inside the government, but also um, among the public, mm -hmm. that the government should be more transparent. This data should be open. You should be able to help us solve these problems. And more, most importantly, you should know how your government is spending your money mm -hmm. um, to get to the things that we promised. Mike, you're, you're Mr. Digital, in, or were, and I guess you're still trying to get away from it. They keep calling you back. You're like the necessary guy in the digital transformation of the British government. I mean, did, 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 how, how did that responsibility feel that, you know, the future rested on you? <laughs> um, well, uh, it's quite heavy, but yeah. it, it rested on a lot of people and still does. So I was a founder of GDS, the Government right. Digital Service, and um, it's interesting to listen what what the guys here are saying because many of this stuff resonates. We had... Uh, a, a number of problems. The first was that we had to reinst reinstate this view of connecting with users. Mm -hmm. Government had sort of lost its way. Many governments have about delivering services. So there's a big responsibility to government. They weigh heavy on your shoulders. But the bigger weight is actually from users who are, weren't getting great services. So digitizing what we have now, our existing services in motoring and transport in so when did, when did you work. found the service? Nine, uh, 2011, we founded it. So um, you've been at it for four years? Four and a half. There was a bit of a run into that at the, the start of the last election, but yeah, it's, it's over the last parliament. And it, it, it exists now. It's in the center of government. It has powers. It has about three, 400 people who are in the center and you know, lots of people in departments and elsewhere. It works with agencies. It's not a client services organization. It has powers to parliament. Um, they weigh quite heavily. Um, but. Um, it's a similar mandate. We're trying to fix a lot of stuff. So what sort of resistance do you run in, went, run into, and, and, and Dominic will bring you in, in here as well, when you have in, incumbent employees and mm -hmm. incumbent processes and ways that they always did things, yeah. and you folks come in mm -hmm. and say, well, we're going to try and change the interface, we're going to try and change the direction. I've talked to Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles, uh, Mayor Bloomberg was a lot like this, Rahm Emanuel, who were data mayors, and said one of their biggest challenges is personnel. Just yeah just bringing along people and changing institutions so that they can actually work with data, work with these interfaces. So what did, how did you seduce the system to well, believe in you? We certainly didn't seduce the system. What we did was open the door to a bunch of people who'd previously been excluded. Hmm. So there's a great correlation between, if you like, the internet generation, the people that you want to bring in, and the desire to make better government and make um, better services. Right. But they've been slightly excluded because of the system of government has really fixated on long-term contracts that can't be touched, on one or two very large suppliers, and this view of size and scope, everything has to be huge and over a long period of time. And we brought in a bunch of people with great political support from Francis Moore, the Minister of Cabinet Office, right. and we set to work bunches of people on really fixing stuff that could be made very, very quickly. And one of the key things we had was agility. We moved quickly, we mm -hmm. fixed stuff, and we made a new compact between ourselves and users. And quite simply, when users saw that, went, that's much better than what was there previously, mm -hmm. we had a feedback loop, and it was very hard for incumbents to say, well, let's turn that off again. Mm -hmm. So our strength was speed, and that's going to resonate in every country that's, and every city that's now trying this, because mm -hmm. many countries and cities around the world face the same problem set. Go at it with speed. People will come to government for two reasons. They want to work with people like themselves. They want to work with a peer group. And if they see their peers going, they will go. But more importantly, they want to do stuff that matters. And if you let them do stuff that matters and fix stuff that they will use as consumers and users, then you're going to get a much stronger emotional buy-in. Dominic, you're a future gov, and you're sort of all about a strategic leap forward in the way we do everything. So what does your world look like? What do you dream about? It's an interesting one. So we, we work around the world with different countries and different cities. So we work from London to Indonesia to Australia and different places. And in many, many ways, there are a lot of similar challenges across all of city government. Um, 
I think exactly what Mike was saying is, is really important, building the capacity in those places to be able to fix themselves. But I think in many ways the danger is that we stop at that um, and that our ambitions aren't high enough. I think it's really hard to get government to fix itself in situ. Mm. Um, you know, there's, whether it's a policy initiative or a digital initiative, changing your organization, rewiring its DNA, which is pretty fixed in any organization. You're born for a reason and you deliver in a certain way. And then if you just digitize that, that's great. You bring it forward. But what we'd like to see is a more sort of uh, two or three pronged attack around like how, how might you think about hitting reboot on government as an institution? What should an organization that's born digital in 2015 look like? How can you make it 10% of the size and the cost, but 200% of the social impact? How do you get government to think about being a social impact organization rather than about a large employer? Like whether you're in right, left, big government, small government, whatever the truth is, the, or whatever the politics is, the truth is that digital and design enable you to build different kinds of institutions. And our risk is that we just put lipstick on the current pig if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. So out there in the world, Dominic, you've seen so many cities. What, who's the worst user of data and digital technology? <laughs> Everybody's got their own challenges, right? Uh -huh. um, but just I play out who's, who, are, who are the couple of the worst players, who are the couple of the best players? Um, I think, God, that's a hard one. I think in many ways, um, there's different, it's cultural challenges, right? I'd more, I'd more see it on a sort of country level in that um, Australia is extremely pragmatic about how it does things. It essentially says, that sounds like a good idea, let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll stop again. Uh, the UK gets you to try and prove everything up front uh, before they'll even take a tiny step forward. Super conservative about how it approaches this stuff. Uh, by the point, for, as an external, you spend the cost of the contract before you've even won the contract, just trying to persuade them. Uh, and then the US is super optimistic, and I love that. But at the same time, you're not allowed to be honest in the US. You're not allowed to say, it's not good enough, we could do better. You have to say, it's awesome, let's make it even more awesome. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that's a little bit... I always ask who's the worst. Yeah, yeah I think it's disabling in that yeah, way, actually. Yeah. I think it's dishonest and disabling. And I think America really needs to be slightly more... Uh, honest about how does it really do things truly differently and better. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Bowser, what was your experience? What's what's in in that? It, it, is he right? Is it is it always really good, but it could be better? Or he are, are you candid with your, right. your folks? And um, <laughs> well, we, we do have a pretty awesome city, and we are really better. <laughs> I used and to live there. I love this. Yes. Uh, so. We, we do think uh, in our city we have the opportunity to, to try a lot of things because we're a great American city. We're kind of a big, small town. We have a flat government, have a highly educated population. I'm going to be talking a little bit later about how we have attracted millennials and technologists and people who want to uh, focus on a lot. We've also invested. We've had some pretty um, tech-savvy, data-driven mayors for several mayors now, and so we have built an infrastructure in our city um, that allows people all across the city to have access to high-speed internet, for example. Uh, we know we need to do more, as um, the mayor was talking about earlier today, to make sure that all of our residents are being trained in coding and being um, tech articulate um, mm -hmm. in graduating from our high schools, ready to enter the job market and really participate uh, in uh, the, the industry that's beginning to grow in, in our city as well. So I think in terms of telling the truth, um, I kind of campaigned on the notion that the government should tell people the truth, that they can handle it, and we don't do a good job of that. But more, mostly, we don't uh, produce data in a way that is digestible to the average person. Uh, and so we ask everybody that works with us not just to produce dashboards that I can read or my city administrator can read, um, but how can the average person use that information to hold their government officials accountable, be it in budget or in policy initiatives? And that, and in that way, I think that's when we'll really truly um, lay bare where, where we are, um, where we need some, some help in government efficiency, mm -hmm. um, but also elicit the, the help of a lot of really smart people. Hillary, and thank you. Hillary, in your, in your world, what are the biggest challenges you find in, in trying to get adoption of these new techniques and methods 
across bureaucracies. I mean, I, I look at Washington, I and mean, I'm, I'm amused by how Dominic framed it, because DC, with the exception of Muriel Bowser, may be the most risk-averse city in the world, right? So, but, but what you guys are talking about, to a certain degree, is a risk for them to move forward in this, and, and, and sometimes things don't work out as well. They, they can be as clunky. So what are some of the biggest challenges you've had? Well, one of the, one of the pillars that we really preach and, and stand upon is, is kind of this notion of leading by example. So we want to walk kind of hand in hand, elbow to elbow with our partners, you know, with the agencies that come to us. And we, we want to essentially usher them through a new experience. Again, you know, for us, it is really about and when I say resetting expectations, it's, it's that so they are better clients for the next people they work with, whether that's us or someone else. They've, they've had a new experience. They've been through a design studio. They've, they've had somebody, you know, saying, you know, focus on the user to them. Are they uh, ever every shocked other that you're from the GSA and not like Google or something? What was the beginning I'm, of that? I mean, they, they, they are, are, are your clients that are government shocked that you're GSA and creative okay. as opposed to, say, contracting out to Google? Possibly, I, you know, I actually don't think they are too shocked, honestly, yeah. uh, because they're, you know, we're working with, uh, we're working with CIO teams, we're working with folks, you know, across the government, teams that have really great ideas. They just haven't had the the, the person power to sort of put them into practice or to figure out that nut to, you know, that, to be able to crack that nut or get around a certain aspect of the bureaucracy. And so they're coming to us to basically say, help us think about a new way to approach this problem, you know, or the, or they've or they've, you know, had. Uh, the experience where they, they've been told or they've been, you know, consulted that they need to do a, a, $300, procure, a $300 million procurement. And we take a step back and we say, well, listen, you could probably get something smaller out the door that would, fig you know, that would, that would prove that you actually need this service for, you know, a tenth of that. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the resetting expectations, it's all across the board. It's, it's about the, having new experiences, but it's also about opening up those lenses and, and different ways of, of approaching a problem. And I, we really, um, I, I, I don't think people look at us like we have six heads anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, and, and we've, we've done it a little bit by design. I mean, the people that we first worked with in our first year were absolutely the folks that were, you know, champing at the bit for something new and a new way to get things done. So we've been able to have some early wins and mm -hmm. we've been able to kind of get some things done with partners that are absolutely like walking arm in arm with us. And, and now I think the challenge for us is to really expand that a little bit. Thank you. Mike, Mike when you took on your task, I think one of the challenges is what, what data, what uh, digital methods did you prioritize over others? Well, the first one was to try and, as you're saying, to try and get data out there in a sense that people can see. Government data is, like many large organizations, not in a great state because right. it's, it's in contracts which weren't designed for the modern age. No problem there. <laughs> so we created GovUK forward slash performance guy called Richard Sargent, brilliant. And you can go on there now and you can find out live service data about how many people are buying a passport or getting a driving license, how many transactions worked, failed, the cost per transaction, all of this stuff. And it's a great tool because you can then see what's working and what's not. And if you extend that, we were saying things like, well, the government provides very some high profile services. How many people call government today? We get 693 million phone calls a year in central government. What's the length of the queue at Heathrow today? That's mm. a pretty germane one for piece of people here, I would think. And these are the sort of indicators that people want. They're much more resonant than some arbitrary data point that you don't understand about an organization that you can't really see through. So we presented that out. The, that was quite easy to do that. The right. biggest cultural barrier mm. was the administrative and cultural response to that, which is how very dare you give users data of that sort. It was like, well, they paid for it and mm. they use a service. I remember one of, the, one of the strangest responses I ever had was when in the, in, in a, in the budget speech in 20, I think 2011, we put in a line to the Chancellor saying, from now on, every politician who is responsible for a digital public service should use it before it goes live. And the response from the system was, how you can't possibly have politicians using this stuff. It's like, well, they're responsible for it. They pay for it. You know, it, it, it makes right. their career. So getting data out, not just for data's sake, but in ways that get people to connect to their politicians and connect to the services that you use. Because the critical thing is what Don said. It's not really about 
do, do we make a better service? And we usually did, and that's great. But the critical thing is that most people use government at the service level. Trust comes from using services that work continuously, that your roads work, that your schools work, and things of this nature. And when they don't work digitally, and when you have to call three times or fill a form out five times, or you don't get the money you need from some benefit, and that impacts your, your fun, you, you feel that. And the people who feel that most are the people who need government the most. And what happens is they lose trust with government. And if government can only be delivered by, or can only be intermediated, if, it, if only intermediaries can deliver government services, people lose trust in government. And what then happens is they stop the democratic participation. So this issue is more than technological and more than data. It really is about the future of government's trust relationship with users. We're only going to have that trust relationship if our data that we present out actually makes sense to people who use them. You know, we, we were going to have the mayor of Tel Aviv with us. He had to go back, and, and he has this whole theory of trying to create a kind of a kibbutz-style city and using data and having platforms where people can share hand drills. And it was, you know, a very utopian notion. I was going to test him or kick him around stage a little bit on this. But, but I guess, you know, part of the question is, is, is I'll, I'll put this to Mayor Bowser, are, are data cities, are digital cities happy cities? I mean, in the kind of... Uh, notion that Mike just shared, it's, it, it's also possible to imagine a very complicated, the more data you have, the more fights you have, the more arguments you have. The, sometimes you can argue against there being so much information about what you're doing that actually impedes progress. Well, I think it very definitely makes you have um, more complicated discussions. So you can't, if everybody can see the same data, you can't tell them um, that everything is, is, is all well. And you know you see, while your city is growing, you see your levels of poverty also increasing. Mm -hmm. uh, while in certain parts of the city things are safe, in other parts of the city you can read and see um, that, they, that they aren't. While you're making huge investments in schools and girls are doing fine, but boys are saying the same, um, you can't say that, uh, that all is well. So it makes us have very complicated um, conversations, but it also helps us direct our, our resources uh, in better ways. So uh, I do think that there's something to, to be said, not only about um, the data that the government provides, but people are sharing data quite informally between themselves. Um, and mm. so the, the, the ease with which people share over social media um, and the ways that our cities are, are better connected with transportation, uh, the people are sharing data all the time about what's really happening in the city. In, in your job, say from, from you know, o over a week, uh, how much would you say your interactions, your decisions are driven by data, say, say compared to what you might have expected? You weren't in your job two years ago, but is it changing? in terms of how you approached your tasks? Well, we are, um, and it's not a day-to-day -day change and sometimes not a week-to-week -week change. We have, in a, we use a stat model in Washington, D.C., a cap stat, where every month or sometimes more, uh, we are evaluating a particular problem, inviting um, all of our agency directors to present the data and make some recommendations around mm. um, that data so we can change from month to month that way. Uh, on an annual basis, we look at our budget and we've asked our staff to kind of change the way we're budgeting, not just from baseline to baseline every single year, but driven by priorities. Mm -hmm. um, and those dashboards, uh, and I asked, so like I said, we're building ours, the agency directors, why are you measuring this? Um, that is a very, and, and we want to be able to measure things that also will tell us if we're getting to our long-term big goals, hmm. not just the basic operations of the machine, um, but if the machine is operating in the way that's going to deliver on the big goals hmm. um, that out, I've outlined. So I think that you know we get data points every single day on different issues, but it's um, month to month and year to year what you're measuring, I think, that makes the biggest difference. Mike, you had thoughts on that? I saw you. Yeah, standards. Yeah. One of the problems we've got, it's all good, is that we need to talk to each other about how we're measuring stuff because we're going to end up, when we're already there, with lots of duplicative standards that don't quite add up. So you can't, a user can't really make a decision whether one city or one country is doing well against another. And it's the same way that we deliver services. We should look, look at standards in any country or city. Do we so negotiate those? Or is there any effort to discuss the, standards across 
transnational standards? There is. There's some organizations that, that we bring stuff together. I mean, were, were it sort of a technical standard, there are international organizations, but governments not really having a lot of bilateral stuff, some small, small numbers of countries coming together, but I don't think enough. I don't, and I certainly don't think enough at the city level, maybe in the States with CFA and stuff like that that's working, but certainly not, in, um, not globally, no. Dominic? Uh, no, I agree totally. Uh, I, my, 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 risk is, my worry here is a little bit that the audience takes away a sort of relatively sort of binary or in a way superficial approach to what changing government through digital and data is. So ultimately doing an open data uh, store or digitizing transactions, these things are all good building blocks. But I think that... What, what are the leadership elements of, of, of change from your perspective? Well, for me, I think it's about not getting caught up in the cool kids' toys, basically. It's about remembering like what you're in it for. You, you, what you're trying to do is better outcomes for your citizens in your city, of which digital uh, data, design, other, other sort of parts of it. And I, I think design is a thing that you know, the, the government digital service have talked about it as a sort of digital as a Trojan horse for design in many yeah. ways, because people can understand digital because everyone has a smartphone, therefore you understand at least the concept of digital, uh, even if you don't understand what's behind it. Mm -hmm. But design is actually the thing that drives everything that I think all of us are doing, which is around what kind of place do you want? What kind of institutions do you need to deliver that kind of outcome? Mm -hmm. And therefore, what kind of modern tools do you need to do to, to make those institutions capable of doing that? And I think as long as people retain that sort of strategic oversight, mm -hmm. but then also are thinking about government really as just one player in place, obviously, right. and how they can support others in their aspirations, that's where this stuff gets really interesting. Well, it's interesting. One of the things when we started, and it, we were very nearly called the government technology service by other people. I was like, no, 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 we're not. We, we'll get the tech. Tech is like commoditized. We can do all that stuff. But with the government digital service, and Dom's right, we're design. And we still, I mean, the first year or two, we had the design principles, which are now really being, I think, copied around the world. But we sat with government and said, we're going to design our way out of this. Service design, 70% of government in, by cost is service design. You should be constantly designing your services around your users' needs. Mm. Introducing design to governments is the single hardest cultural thing I have ever done and ever mm. seen happen around me. Because you go, walk in and the dial is set to procurement, it's set to process, it's set to big IT. Right. People going, right, yo, so five year deal, big procurement. And you walk in and you go, we're going to make it beautiful for users. We're going to do the hard stuff, the really hard stuff behind the scenes to make it simple for users. We're right. going to listen to them and change it every day. And by the way, it's going to look beautiful. And right. introducing beauty to government services is not the easiest thing, I can tell you. Yeah, interesting. Let me take, uh, I've got time for just one or two quick questions from the audience. So I would love to take any comments or thoughts. Steve, we have a question right yeah, here. Right here. OK. We can't see you, I'm sorry. Yep. Yes. Hello, just um, a quick point of information. I'm Peter Madden. I run the Future Cities Catapult here in the UK. We are doing city standards. 15 UK cities, 15 big companies, 15 small companies, BSI and others working together. So implementing the stuff in diverse bottom-up pr projects around the country and then setting standards and learning from them so that we can gradually build up best practice. Right, so that sounds promising. Have you been working together? Uh, a little, but not yeah. on that. So that's good, but like when they're in working in Washington and... Canberra and DC, and we'll be, we'll be good. Other comments, questions? Yes, right here in the front. Jess has a microphone for you. Just to add on that last comment from the British standards, um, I work with ISO, and we've just created a new standard for cities, ISO 37120, that will standardize data across all cities. So I'm from the World Council on City Data. We're implementing that standard now. So there's hope. <laughs> there's hope. Good to hear. So just to, to wrap up then, and finally, when you're thinking, you know, and oftentimes I feel like in panels like this, one of our jobs is sort of imagine what we need to have made uh, happen to, to have a really cool, you know, 10 or 15 year outcome, projecting ourselves. What do you think the biggest challenges are, decision points that we need to get over. Let me start with Dominic. Uh, for me, it has to be literacy and uh, literacy. At, a, at, a, at, a, at a leadership level. Um, the reason that my life's changed, uh, so FutureGov, we started FutureGov seven, seven years ago, right. but the last four years since GDS and, and the same in the US and now in 
Australia as well, where we mostly work, the way, the way that everything has changed for us is having people on the inside that we can talk to. Mm -hmm. So before we were trying to persuade people who were excited and excitable, but didn't know, couldn't go beyond that. Like it felt the right thing, but you, what does you it needed, actually you mean? Needed now we have like, well, you know, without being rude, intelligent clients in that way. People who can understand their organizational needs and where other people can add value to help them deliver what they're trying to deliver. Hillary? Uh, Dom and, and Mike both touched on this concept of service design, and I think digital is only a part of the puzzle. You know, you've got to recognize that uh, whether you're delivering, you know, motor vehicle uh, registrations or whether you're delivering a, a service that is based on open data, that service is larger than the thing that you're putting on somebody's smartphone or on somebody's laptop and, and the service that they see online. And so it's, it's incumbent upon the folks that are helping get those things built on, on teams like ours to say, look, this is, this is bigger. This is a design design problem. This is something that we have to think about beyond just the screen in front of people. Um, and so I think, I think service design is a, is a big piece of that puzzle. Mike? I'll go one further. We started with the dirt service design. That's worked. I agree completely. We're sitting in a late Victorian building, this hotel, which is beautiful. has a very interesting background. Nearly went, actually. Our institutions need redesigning. Mm. That's the big deal. What digital shows us is that Victorian in institutions designed in the Victorian era are often not fit for purpose. You can put more money in them, you can put more people in them, and you'll get some better services. We've done that, we continue to do it, and that alone is worth doing. Are they the right institutional design to deal with the future that's coming towards us rapidly? I doubt it. I don't think we need 350 pieces, different institutions in government, to get a common platform to send and receive money to users. We don't have to do that 350 times. We can do it once. That's a challenge to our institutional makeup and to our power structures. And that's the big thing that digital brings. It brings that challenge here. If you want to know more, the, the founder of GDS, or co-founder Tom Lusmore, was in this audience somewhere. He gave a great speech at Code for America this year about that issue, about mm. institutional design. And digital and design brings that question to the heart of government very quickly, at a policy level, at a political level, and at a user level. Fascinating. Mayor Bowser, last word. I think for us, it's attracting uh, the best people in government. and. Uh, on that note, we're looking for the next CTO of the District of Columbia for Washington, D.C., which would be a great opportunity. Um, but also people who are not only smart about what they're doing on, uh, to build our team, but willing uh, to translate their knowledge to government workers. Um, so how do we, we won't, be, we won't be replacing everybody that works for the government. Uh, how can we make sure that they are knowledgeable, intelligent about these solutions? Um, and the, because they have the context of what that service means to the people that they're serving. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of hand to Mayor Muriel Bowser, Mike Bracken, Hillary Hartley, and Dominic Campbell. Thank you very, very much.